Do you remember the joy of discovery as a kid? Of sitting next to a rock pool and looking at all the little critters inside and discovering that actual animals lived inside the shells? Or the sheer mind-blowing enormity of realising that the light from stars started its journey billions of years ago? I don't. I think I've just been described as uh, functional but not attractive. But anyway. <laughs> um, I was that little muddy kid off in the distance, and I was sitting next to a pile of rocks and sticks, and what I was trying to do was figure out if I could use waves to get a leaf from one side of a puddle to another. And so what I didn't realise at the time was that what you're looking at is an engineer. <laughs> and what I want to do today is to encourage all of you to think about who might be the prospective engineers in the world around you. Or indeed, are you yourself an engineer in denial, just like I was? And I want to do that by completely repainting the picture that you have in your mind about what an engineer is and what it is we do. And we need to do that because the next great wave of engineering is coming, and this time it's going to be about the engineering of us, of our society. So now I come from a family of engineers, so you would have thought that if anyone would have had a clue, it would have been me. But I didn't, and basically it's because I wasn't listening. So my dad was a mechanical engineer, and he used to tell me lots of stories about his passion. But what I heard were stories about crankshafts and gearboxes and things. He also used to tell me lots of stories about his dad, who was a civil engineer. But what I heard were stories about roads and bridges. <laughs> really. Um, so what I should have heard were stories that spoke to the idea of technology and service to people. Or stories of uh, moments of profound creativity like the time that my dad was so taken by his muse that he actually drew the design for a gearbox on a piece of toilet paper instead of using it for something else entirely. <laughs> what I should have heard was that engineers are creative, professional problem finders. We're motivated by making a difference in people's lives using technology. And for us, science and maths are tools, they're actually not the point. And so when it came time for me to work out what I was going to do after school, I walked away from that little kid. My understanding of engineering was crankshafts and gearboxes and things, uh, and so I chose the only thing I knew I was good at, which was science. And it took me 10 years to unwind that decision and find my way back to that little girl who was just so gripped by a problem she just couldn't quite solve. Now, it turns out that actually uh, coming late to engineering has been really good for me, and of course it's all about me. Um, <laughs> I get to tr participate in one of the most profound transformative periods in the interaction between in uh, technology and society. We live in a highly interconnected world, and technology has been democratised, disrupted, and it's being distributed in completely unprecedented ways. And so that means that the opportunities for all of us are enormous, as are the risks. And it turns out that that's what engineers are good for. We are the people who balance technological opportunity with technological risk, and all in impeccable fashion and style. <laughs> so now more than ever, we need engineers. We are the people who bring together people, technology, and society. But we need to do a whole lot better at explaining what it is we do. And honestly, we need more and we need different. And that's my mission and my passion, and I need your help. So in my day job, I spend a lot of time talking with parents, educators, and employers of young people. And I see a number of really worrying trends. In fact, mostly what I see is that my journey away from money stick girl kid uh, is actually quite normal still. We're simply not getting enough people who want to be engineers, and they're getting knocked onto uh, other career paths. So, for example, in Australia, Australian universities produce about three times as many scientists as can actually find employment, and half as many engineers as we need. The participation rates of young people taking the kinds of courses that get them into en engineering at university is less than 10% and dropping. And the percentage of female engineers in Australia is still stubbornly stuck below 20%. In fact, there are a quarter of a million engineers in Australia, and fewer than a thousand of them are women over 50. So we all need to care about this. This is not about employability and career prospects. This is about the world in which we all live. So think about all of the transformative periods in the interaction between technology and society. Civil engineers gave us clean water and the roads and bridges that allowed us to tra trade with our neighbours. Mechanical engineers brought us the boats, trains and cars that allowed us to trade and travel at previously unprecedented distances. Aeronautical engineers gave us access to the globe. 
and electrical engineers brought us the safe, clean, cheap energy that freed women from domestic purgatory. And electronic engineering, followed by computing, brought the world to us through television and then the internet. And every one of those engineering disciplines interacted so profoundly with the society that it, in which it was located that it actually gave rise to the next engineering discipline. And right now, the combination of the Internet of Things, social media, and artificial intelligence means that the next great engineering discipline is just about to be born. And this one, because it's about how connected we are to each other and to things, is actually going to have us inside the machine. Now, that's really profound. And if you are not wondering about the level of the sophistication of design that sits behind most of your tech, you really need to start wondering about that. So I spend a lot of time talking with people who are used to thinking on a national and global scale. And when I ask them questions like, well, so what are you going to do with all that data once you've got it? The answer that comes back is silence. That's really telling. We're just about to have access to precise, detailed, real-time data about our actions and our interactions. And that's going to mean that people and algorithms can make decisions that will affect the way that we behave. Now, that's actually a control loop. And up until now, control engineering has been used to engineer things. But guess what? Not anymore. This time, it's us. So let me give you an example. Think about the ride-sharing service Uber. So we all know what happens when surge pricing kicks in, which is basically prices go up, and we suck it up until such time as prices become ridiculous, and then we find some other way of getting home. And then demand drops, prices drop, and everyone's happy again. But my point here is that that algorithm is actually dictating or driving the way that we interact with each other. So let's think about, and in, in and of itself, that kind of doesn't matter because, um, at least in principle, engagement with a, with a ride-sharing service is optional. But what about situations where it's not optional, like dynamic delivery of taxes or welfare payments or something like that? What about another example? So this one's not hypothetical. Imagine, what, what if the next source of social disadvantage is actually poor access to data? So imagine you're running and living on a cattle station in a remote part of a country somewhere, and you need to make use of precise, detailed, real-time data about the weight and condition of your cattle so you can work out where to send them on the station. And then what are you going to do when your internet connection drops out because a couple of million people in a city on the other side of the continent all simultaneously decide that they want to binge watch the next season of Game of Thrones. <laughs> that one's not hypothetical. So here's another example. It's actually really easy to imagine ways of making use of Twitter usage to optimize the delivery of public transport in a city. It's also really easy to imagine ways that that algorithm could spin out of control and deny public transport to great swathes of the same city. And then what happens when that interacts with uh, the dynamic delivery of in-home health care or in-home education? That's a situation where you need a detailed, technical, and quantitative approach to system design, as well as a technical assessment of risk. And do we really want business owners, insurers, and politicians making those sorts of decisions for us on the basis of a passing understanding of tech and a suck it and see attitude? I really don't think so. What we actually need is a new type of engineer to do that. But before we do that, we actually need to create the new engineering discipline. And so that new engineering discipline is going to be about the safe design and operation of the engine that's composed of all of us. Now, we actually don't know what that means because we don't know what it means to be uh, living in such a technologically rich world. Whatever this thing is, it's going to involve computing, control engineering, anthropology, design, psychology, tech, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, and that's what my colleagues at the Australian National University are doing basically right now, uh, in collaboration with some of the most interesting thinkers in the world. We're trying to give shape to this thing, whatever it is. And that will be our contribution to the evolving relationship between technology and society. And then what we need to do is go find the next great wave of engineers. And these are going to be people who are willing and able to engage in the complexity of bringing together people, technological systems, and science in a highly distributed and interconnected world. And the way we're going to find them is through the stories we tell. They're heard in ways that you can't anticipate, and, but they shape lives and they shape choices, not just for me and my choices, but actually for hundreds of thousands of others. And so let's be really clear about this. You don't have to choose between changing the world and being an engineer. In fact, look around you. We don't live in a natural world. You don't have to choose between being a creative and a tech. Creatives love to make things. And so just think of all of the really cool things you can make if you master science and maths. 
But let's also be really clear, this is not just about just making cool stuff using tech. My people, engineers, understand that this is about technology and service to people, not the other way around. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this new picture that you have in your mind of what an engineer is, not that actual picture, um, and go out and talk to as many people as you can find. And please, encourage them to think, completely rethink the way that they remake the world around them. Thank you very much.